hey. So weird. Oh, hold on. I'm not sure I understand this one. Oh, so I was going to read some more in this Stid Hospital records. Of course, this was dated 84. Said I presented myself in a very likable manner, pleasant and cooperative throughout this interview. Oh, he said that he had school behavior at home at a party last Friday was the reason for his admission to the adolescent treatment unit in Wilmer, Minnesota. And they kicked me out of school. Said that I describe my typical mood as happy and energetic. Things that make him angry include being antagonized by others or when people say rotten things about me. <sighs> and that doesn't bother me anymore. Steve stated that in school when he was angry, he would just leave and also he would leave the house to go talk with friends. I had friends before they admitted me to the state hospital. Wilmer, Minnesota. The state of Minnesota. Oh, wait a minute. PZ74206602. This was a professional again. Steve admitted some suicidal ideation gesturing but was hesitant to talk about it because he doesn't want to be labeled as crazy. He said, I, I said, I became upset one day when, when his mother said he was going to be placed in treatment center. He said that I cut my wrist with a piece of glass. It was just really superficial. I said that I used to watch Days of Our Lives with my grandma. She loved that show. And it was funny because we could watch it and then not watch it for a year and it would be the same. <laughs> Sorry. I liked swimming. Once I was laying on the beach and they said that I was fainting, drowning, and that people got really mad. And they thought that I might be hurt. I wasn't. I didn't have any hallucinations or delusional problems. He just wanted to run, and run home and slap his mom. I wouldn't have done that. He was very good at yoga, even at that age. That's Thanks, Newt. I think somebody took that book. I'll have to look for it. I, I used it so much, I read it so much, knew it, that the binding on the side of it, it wore thin. No, I won't say that. I won't. Oh, it said that they encouraged me to talk. Oh, and that I was very limber. And it was very important for yoga. Well, that's because grandma made us go to gymnastics. And water skiing. I loved water skiing. I had difficulty sleeping then, but no problems concentrating. Talked about my dad. Oh my, Steve wants to work. This is what I said. This is what she wrote down. Mary. <sighs> wants to work on his behaviors such as minding, listening, and not being in any hassles, as well as getting along with his mother and authority figures. I never mentioned anything about stealing. He noted voiced fears of being abused by his peers, possibly being scapegoated. I was afraid of tattling even back then. They gave me an Axis One 
from the DSM-3, which is strange. Adjustment disorder with disturbances of conduct. <laughs> And then they said Axis 4 was stressors, frequent changes of schools, chronic parental fighting, physical abuse. That's when I was in Cottage 11. M5743. Oh, they were saying I needed to work on my stuffed feelings regarding the abuse. It must be done very gently or softly in a nurturing way. It was never nurturing. It was like, it's your turn. Tell me how you feel. It was not. And then you told them how you felt and you got in trouble. Like, here, work on your feelings and tell me how you feel. But if you tell us how you really feel, then you're in trouble compounding torture. Let's talk about your torture and your abuse as a childhood, but if we don't like what you say, you can't talk about it. Uh. And they made us talk about it all the time. They said I was impulsive. Yeah. Well, I said that my mom only only called when something tragic happened. It's funny that they would always say you gotta earn a certain step first. And what was funny about that is that they put up these things that you really couldn't do because you were children, uh, you know. Of course, they said develop a suitable foster placement plan. No health problems. You know, Minnesota was really complicit in, like, contributing to my... No, I'm, I'm going to take that back. I don't know. They knew what was going on there, and they didn't do anything. My mom talked about family counseling. I love you, Mom, but, you know, you hadn't even worked on your own issues with your own mother. Or you didn't even tell us about our older brother until it was too late, and then you didn't know where he was. You said he was in jail or prison. I had problems in school screwing around. Yeah, they knew I was in the state hospital. I said that yesterday. Oh, and then I had problems with, this one says that I had problems with 15 months stay at Varnon Boys Ranch, waiting another residential treatment. Stephen's chaotic, multi-problem family. Do you know what? They always blamed the fam my family, and it wasn't the any of us kids' fault. It's the thing about children. You know, if they have environments that are stable, you know, and they don't have to be one family unit, you know, that's what I asked in the first place, is that we have some, with Tara and I, Tara Beth Cain's and aliases. And John, stay out of this business. You showed her all those records of mine on my computer. I asked Monty to look into it. 
and she wouldn't, she said, you know, PPL wouldn't do it. I saw those guys though working on the computers all the time, erasing stuff. They erased all the computers in the, in the day room there. I wonder why. It's because you guys were stealing my stuff and looking at it. And you all had your own internet access. Emily kindly gave me hers. You know, Robert paid for that, or Tara. I'm not blaming anybody. I don't really care anymore. Sean knows. They told me Sean knew Tara. I'm not blaming Sean, though. I don't want any harm to come to anyone. Yay, and I got discharged to the group home. Of course, I cursive signed my name back then. That was a, I did that until, oh, sometime in the 90s I stopped cursive writing. It's just different. Paul. Steve admits that he would, has not been minding a lot at home. I usually do what I'm told unless I'm with my friends. I'm wondering what, what child, when they're with their friends, you know, it's a developmental process about kids is they do have learning. Are they, they tend to rather stick with their friends and ignore their parents when they're there. Because it's a social interaction. Of course, this has all been altered. Christina. Again, they said I was lazy. Recent efforts to deal with Steve's behavior problems in the community having failed. Residential treatment now seems appropriate and least restrictive alternative. Of course, they won't admit that it was actually before then. Well, even if it wasn't, I was 12. Frequent redirections to remain on task. I was a good swimmer, they noted. We did swim there. In life savings, life saving classes. I was a like a high level, why well, could have been a lifeguard? Oh, incorporate with his treatment plan. Let's see, in the 80s, treatment plans for kids were okay, you don't have a choice. You're going to do this. And we just, like, have you in these meetings. Just, it was torture. <laughs> oh, here's where I said, some of the issues Steve has addressed here include parent separation and fears that his mother may disappear again, questioning his stepfather's death, as well as everyday problems on the unit. Yeah, they were, um sexually abusing 
boys there, including myself. I remember Wally and Mary and John, all these. More crafts. Oh, prove that I can behave responsibly at school. <clears throat> I guess I did that. You know, when I excelled in high school and was an A student and it was in French and German and Spanish and, you know, and went to college for 20 some years. I got several degrees and wrote a book and have no fears about talking about my early childhood, especially since I'm one of the only ones that have those records from the state hospital. I know your names, too. I used to have pictures of you. I probably could find them if I tried. I bet you they're on my grandma's camera rolls. And negatives. I remember sitting outside on the back, looking at the lake. Well... Oh, these are just... Oh, it, a 12-year-old is admitted, yeah. I won't even tell you what I just thought there. Oh, these just go on and on and on and on. I'm just going to go to a different one. That was the state hospital. Mm -hmm. This one's interesting. This, of course, is the Barnum Boys Home 82. A year and a month after Grandpa died. Of course, you know, his birthday was just a little while ago, a couple days ago. I was 10. I was only there for 15 months. I was in Mainstream in St. Francis. Craig. Oh, I was unwilling to state my need for change. Um, oh, sorry, my hair. Uh, let's see, a 10-year-old. Do you need to change? No. What do 10-year-olds think about change? It's my world. Everything's mine. I have my friends. I don't want to listen to you. That's what they think. Not that I would know, having studied child development and, you know, child literature and, you know, took care of children in the ICU and in the ER and throughout the hospital and in the pediatric bone marrow transplant unit. And then I refused to do what I was told. Well, let's see. I was abused and my mom watched it. And we were all hurting. We hadn't healed yet. And we were forced to go to some ridiculous treatments out in California. They said I needed residential treatment for more than a year. A year or more. Well, thank God for our nun. Thank God for Brenda. Said that I... Yeah. 
it says Steve is able to express feelings well and he should be encouraged to continue stating feelings rather than stuffing them and acting out in unproductive ways. Well, apparently I didn't do that because my environment wasn't very productive. Apparently there were, and this was 2-3-82, that um, the first month will be devoted to helping Steve learn the ropes and adjust to the program. I, I was seen as a needy, lonely, inadequate, feeling inhibited, inhibited and acting out boy whose symptoms represent his protest to a sense of deprivation. Uh, it was because I was starved for attention and the only attention I got was beatings and torture and sexual abuse. And neglect. The only friend, the only comfort that I had was my friends. My own dad sent me out in a tornado. said I was really cared about my appearance. I kind of lack on that now. <laughs> you know. We worked on doing our own laundry and cooking and working on cars. And that I was willing to change my negative behavior with a prompt. Well, and I think they were probably careful about what negative behavior was since it was a home with boys in it. Can you imagine a home with 10 boys in it? What that would be like? Ooh, I mean, you would have to just be a little bit willing to be... I'm going to let that go. You know? I was pretty independent and handled that well. This was in 583. 5483. And I like trying new things. I can. I was able to keep myself occupied. Wrestling and softball, I did that. And my, my mom reported that my behavior was within acceptable limits. and continue developing emotionally. It was hard to do that when we had new fathers all the time. And there was infighting in the family. I don't blame my mom. I love my mom. They said I could be snobbish, which is strange. He has leadership potential, which he uses when adults are present and encourages him to be positive and involved. Oh, and then I was still working on independent discussion of feelings, friendship building, family therapy. They said that mainly I needed a big brother. I had a big brother. He's the reason I got strangled. And he left me on the fence with the rattlesnake. And then he called me the Buddha. After I scolded him and told him I could not talk to him anymore because of his own behaviors. Oh, here's when my mom said that she was forced into the crisis center herself in January, grandma's worst month. 
well, there was a time period in January. Not Savea's birthday. That wasn't it. It was before then. I loved it there. Not that place. That's I saw that in there. I was like, yuck. I needed stable caretakers who could talk to me about resolving some of these feelings. I, you know, people always thought that I needed to talk about them. And I talked my whole entire life about it. I'm just doing it now because I'm like, they won't let me work. Everybody keeps firing me. Even the guy that I really liked. That that lady gave me a kiss twice. And that one lady on the street hugged me and said, You're so cute. I didn't even know them. Well, that one lady was on the floor. I mean, I was working VIP at that section. Both places. Let's see. Oh, they said I had temper tantrums and negative attention-seeking behavior and defiance. Oh, I brushed him today and his hair is all over the place. Said I was a product of a broken home. Parents were divorced when he was six, even though it was earlier than that. <laughs> and all of these are so... This was in March of 82. It was around when I was three. Because the court trial was in 74. And then we went to California. Bailey, here, come back here. Oh, it said that I adjusted really well to... They called it the Boys Ranch. In Creekside, that was such a nice. And you know, we never really hung out with any of the other guys unless, I don't know, unless we were at school there or. And it said I had a low socialist self esteem initially, under socialized. Trust was a problem. Needy, lonely, inadequate feelings. You know. I wasn't really lonely, though, because I had friends before they started sticking us in treatment centers. And there was social or self-esteem problems because I was beat and tortured and then I had to live with my mother, who let it happen. Marvin. When they wrote it all here. He stole the refrigerator. And then my mom left shortly after that, and then he died of a heart attack. I looked for that death record in California. I wasn't sure. I couldn't find it. Who knows, though? A gambler could have changed his name a hundred times. Somebody could have been after him. I never really... We thought we saw him. I told you at Perkins and Wilmer. Scared us all. You know, not that that man would have made it to Minnesota. We would have hunted him down like a dog. I actually don't even care anymore about him. Oh, oh these are just custody things about, yeah. 
this is the one grandma made five copies each for one of each a copy for each one of us oh well that's different than ooh, ooh, ooh. Ooh. oh rice hospital I love these guys too I you know I hate to say that but I did like because they were so, this was in one eleven eighty two. Don't make me tell you what all happened between. Yeah, you don't want to know. January, the beginning of January, pretty much the coldest time in the entire world. You know. Oh, they said that, you know what is funny is that they blame it all on the child. I had a number two. I had a room number, 385. They blame it on the child. So it's, I've been a chronic problem for his mother. And it's like, okay, so yeah. And of course, sometimes... That's all they take into account is like their parents. Maybe they didn't know the f full force of what we were dealing with. I ran away from foster homes. I said that I bite people and kick and threw things at, and I was like, no. Oh, she's gone every night and leaves me alone. She cares more about herself than us. She hates us, I said. She wants me in foster home because she doesn't like me. And I said, I like my mom. I love her. I just wish that she could come to terms with You know, ah. running at 10 months and talking at nine months and crawling early. I played mostly with my sisters. Well, and Ricky, it was a lot because Margie and Chrissy and I were really close. And we did a lot together. Ricky, too. But he was, he wasn't, and Ricky was the daredevil, too. I mean, really. So we were like, what is he doing? You know. Oh, here's my number here. 81845. Assigned a number. Of course, that's at Rice Hospital. And I liked Rice Hospital, even though they made my grandma quit working there. Oh, yeah, here's also, she's talking about having problems dealing with Chrissy. And Ricky was already in foster care. that I was non dis non aggressive, under socialized. It says confidential. It's not confidential if I release it, since I got it. You know. And it's patients' right to see their records, so we were all in foster homes in nineteen seventy four. Before we went to um, California that's when the judge, there was a no signature on the judge's order. If you ever go to court for custody and the judge doesn't sign something, it's false. Just like this one. You know, that S-E and E was bullshit.
What's funny too is they looked at cranial nerves on a number. Yeah, cranial nerves. You know what you do with pediatric assessment of a no normal, healthy child? Yeah, they're talking, they're running, they're interacting, their speech is normal. You know? Now they have to do it because of insurance billing. They have to hit so many exam points. Isn't that sad? They have to get points. Like, we have to assess something. You know, we used to look at kids that were just in for an earache and be like, hey, buddy, you know, like, how are you doing? And they're like, ah, and it's like, oh, your ear hurts? And they were talking, and, you know, it's like, oh, yeah, are we? You know, and then, you know, and then having them be scared and then have doctors like, ah. you know, I'm not slamming doctors, some of it's needed, but, and some nurses were, nurse ratchet with them, scared them, that's what scared them, you can't just be mean to kids, I mean, and who knows, you know, well, I'm glad I'm reading this to you, oh, hey, listen, I was cleaning this morning, I cleaned the entire part, apartment. I vacuumed, I dusted, I cleaned the fan blades, took it apart. And while I was cleaning, I was like, yeah, I was thinking, I had some kind of, you know, because I was a perfectionist in school. And then I said, what am I doing? I'm like wiping down the front of the dresser, taking the fan blades apart, wiping the backs of doors. <laughs> and I was like, oh, so I just finished what I was doing. I just thought I'd throw that in there. And I got all the car hair on. I mean, I'll, I'm going to brush you again later. I want one of those hand ones. Hugo doesn't like it as much. One pastor from Bethel Church. It's helpful. What did, what did he do? Talk to my grandma? Did he talk to my mom much? And yeah, they talked about having a big brother. I told you I had a big brother. He took me to an Iron Maiden concert. With his older friends who were stoned. I mean... And he... Well, he turned me on to Alice Cooper from inside. Which, well, thankfully, because I like that album. And Randy, if you're listening, we had the same taste in music. Thanks for that. That's what... I was going to not see you that first time when you left the your office twice. I said, I'm going to give him one more chance. And if he leaves the office one more time, you're done. But you didn't. Thank you. And then that Alice Cooper reference, that was a done deal. I should have seen you in the first place. I felt like I was talking to a colleague. Ah. Oh. They were talking about alter his schedule and or reward system. It's really hard to set up rewards and punishment inside a locked adult psychiatric unit for an 11 year old thank god mary let me sit in her office most of the time and dan thank god for you too again i still always wanted to live with my mom I just love this. Never mind. It said sometimes I don't get to sleep until 1 a.m. I was scared sometimes in there. I mean, it wasn't quiet all the time. I remember which room I was in. Too. Well, it said which room I was in. But I remember too. 
and the nurses were really nice to me. They were. And I appreciate, I went back to see Mary when I did my clinicals, when I was doing ECT. Well, it was not pleasant. Yeah, I don't even want to say that. But I will. I did clinicals there, and I had, had to do ECT, like, monitoring during those treatments. And that's the only thing. I picked, I picked same-day procedures, and that's what they were doing. And I was just like, Ugh. that one guy used the paddles, and I was like, not good. They said, well, he likes, and I was like, again, there's all this handwritten stuff. These nurses didn't write a book, you know. Oh, Margie was up to see me at 4 p.m. on 1-17-82. And her friend. I had school there in the lounge. I do remember that. principal was there for a moment. I hate to say it. I have, well, I don't, because I actually didn't mind Rice Memorial Hospital. I mean, yes, I did mind it. I didn't want to be there. I said I didn't want to go to that funny farm. I would rather stay here. That was on one twenty one eighty two at eight nine o'clock in the morning. I wanted my mom and dad to be back together and not go to the funny farm. I think they were already talking about sending me there. It took a while though to get me there because I told you they needed to have a special court order. I think they thought they were doing me a favor by keeping me in Wilmer. And it, they just ended up compounding the abuse and the torture. I was at a court hearing that day. And they said I was sarcastic. Uh, yeah? About court? They were going to send me to the state hospital. They don't really go into that though in these notes. They don't say, oh, the reason maybe behind his sarcasm might have been the fact that we're gonna place him in the state hospital with boys like four or five years older that are, you know, in there for criminal sexual account, you know, conduct and, you know, armed robbery <laughs> that were waiting placement for long-term adult, you know, I don't know. It might have been something like that. I took some Advil and active fat. Well, my friend Lisa, who died suddenly in her home with... Chrissy told me that. I felt so bad. I love Lisa. But she called me that night, and something was wrong. Or, and then I called her. I was at the Greenleys. Something happened to her. They said here where I tried to hang myself. I really did want to hang myself when I was at the group home. And what young boy does that? 
I had a lot of things going on inside my mind. I was still trying to deal with all the stuff that happened at the state hospital. And I was still trying to piece together parts of my life about California and the severe abuse and torture that I had. And I, um, I'm not, you know, I look back and then I think, you know, that's not uncommon for, you know, torture survivors to blame themselves, especially if they're stuck in institutions that further perpetuate the pain. I never said that before. No one ever asked, though. Cabrini people thought I was snobby. And they thought I came from money. They didn't know my whole family was ripped apart from the time we were three. And everybody in the family knew we were being abused. The Somides knew. The Coxes knew. The other Lindquists knew. <coughs> the Lonegers knew. Johnny's, you knew. Harold said we would never amount to anything in our lives. I saved that letter. It was too painful, so I didn't want to show Chrissy and Margie. I suppose they know now. I don't know why I got all the records. I felt like something was going to happen. Well, and for one, I wanted to like, I wanted to have, I wanted to, that's my history. That's my life. I didn't want it to be destroyed or taken away from me. And Kim was right. I did. And I was right, I told her. I dug deep into it, and I got kind of lost in it, like I fell into it. I kind of fell into my life. And then I started frantically working on things to get things like something was going to happen. Three West. I know that they redid, I think they redid that unit. I was angry at my mom. I don't want to hurt my mom by saying this. I already talked to her. I already talked to her so much about it. And then my grandma would get mad at my mom. Well, my grandma was trying to protect us. And she was giving her money. She paid for the rent in Mary Avenue. And cable. Mary Avenue is when we used to take those sleds, those orange sleds down the stairs. That's where I have the pictures of Paul from. What is this one? Oh, that was more Kim stuff. What's... I was honest with Kim right away. She...
She never judged me, but she did write like a banshee. I mean, it's just 300 and some pages or more. Oh, here's more of the Rice Hospital stuff. Or did I just read this one? I never... I... Oh, let's see what this is. The my emancipation. I had emancipated. Well, this is in ninety in eighty six. At the group home. So I was at St. Francis from eighty two to eighty five. The Wilmer State Hospital. And I was at the group home, I think, twice, or maybe once. My group, my behavior had not been bad. <coughs> well, hey, can you want to boys group home? When you have a tortured child, and then you put him in a state institution, and they sexually abuse him and torture him more, and make him talk about it, and talk about it, and talk about it, and talk about it. And keep sending him back to a family that can't even support him and then stick him in more treatment and more treatment. My behavior was damn fucking good. And Paul, you know, thanks for what you, what you did there. But you better realize that. You can't just say not bad, you know. And... You were responsible for making those kids sit on that damn fucking bench. Sorry for swearing. You know, you sit on a bench for five hours or two hours for not doing your house job. I did meet a really good friend there. You know, to, I said that, I wrote that once. Two hurt boys just trying to find some, like, something in themselves. You know, innocent kids. I didn't think anything was wrong with that. It was sometimes the only comfort I could get is from other hurt kids. Because adults didn't know it. You know? And you know what? Sometimes it was sexual. You know? You know why? Because that's sometimes the only thing little kids can feel when they've been sexually abused and hurt and tortured. And that's, you know, that's what they think love is. And that wasn't the case for me there. I'd already dealt with so much of it. It was just more, I don't know, Bailey's freaking out. I have the right to remain silent or testify for myself as a child, right? Confront and cross-examine all witnesses against him or and appeal the decision by the court. Do you know what that means? Please don't put me there. And they did anyways. I'm not sad about any of this in my life. And I'm not sad about having my mom as my mom. You know, I think sometimes I, Tara wanted me to be really angry at her. Maybe some of that was Tara's anger coming through me. 
you know, you can't pick your parents. You know, and sometimes, like I said, I rationalize her behavior. I know her mom was really mean to her. That doesn't give her the excuse, though, for what she did. And I'm not excusing her behavior. I'm just saying, I still love my mom. Even though she makes bad choices. You know? This is when I got emancipated in 88. And then I went to live with my mom again. And went to college. I know I'm kind of skipping around because I have these in kind of a weird order here. Well, we were in custody of the state of Minnesota in the 70s too. You know? 12-year-old boy, M5743, admitted to the state hospital. I'm not saying this to be painful for anybody. I'm talking about it because a lot of times people don't know what goes on in institutions. And I did tell the Tara once I said, I would be more than happy to sit down and talk to you about all this information. She didn't have to go and steal it. Bailey. <clears throat> yeah, they said I was being sarcastic towards them. I was being sexually abused there. At one time... At one time, at one time I, um, well, I told them, and they said they confronted the other kid, but it was so much more than that. And like I said, and that's what kids do sometimes when they have to survive, and I'm not saying do that, because don't. You need to talk about it. But kids that come from abused homes where there's torture and violence sometimes gravitate to people who can protect them even though they're abusing them. And I did that. I picked some of the biggest kids. Well, they were abusing me and then I was like, well, I'm gonna just, you know, don't protect me, you know? I was a small boy. And they did protect me. And they knew. I mean, I don't know why people wanted me to. I talked about this my whole life. And you know, I didn't talk about it too much with Kim because it really wasn't necessary. And now I feel like, well, you know. But here again, I'm not talking, well, I'm talking to an objective person, myself. I can be objective about it, because I was trained to be clinical. And I can be emotional about it, too. But it doesn't hurt as much anymore. I always felt more towards the other kids. And that's why sometimes when kids were acting out, I would act out to get them out of trouble. And it was, I mean, you did that for each other there. And since I had nothing to lose anyways, I had nowhere to go. Some of those kids were going to go home in the, like a month. And I was like, okay. You know, and we did that for each other. You know, we knew when, if somebody was had a, you know, discharge date coming up, they weren't going to get in any trouble and they were going to have fun.
I still can't believe I would get in trouble for saying things like the rec room was the only place we could be except for outside and you had to be on a certain level to go outside. Hyperactive, abused children stuck in one room. We did play a lot of cards and a lot of chess and some pool. A lot of times that's where some of the sexual abuse happened. I was playing chess. And you know what? I don't even blame that guy. I don't. And that's kind of weird. I know his name. And I know the other guy's name. I don't know why I don't blame him. I think it's because I knew what was going on there on a different level. I don't know. Well, and for one, they were protecting me. Except for one of them. <laughs> but I don't... I don't... I don't wish them any harm. It was a different time. And it was... It was hard. It wasn't easy. No. And when I said I was easy to get to know, I'm sorry. <laughs> it was a lie. I'm just thumbing through this. Here they wrote down other numbered boys. It was a numbered boy that I went to school with, mainstream. We might as well have been guinea pigs. You know. They said my body language continued to interfere with, with my message when I was talking to people, mostly because I was defensive, you know. Here's a couple more numbered boys, three numbered boys here. I was, well, involved with a, a fight. You know, you know, with other numbered boys, and then I encouraged it. Yeah, maybe because they were sexually abusing my friends. And that's what you do too, is you protect new kids. And I was the, the littlest kid there. And you should have seen how small I was. I should go back and look at my how tall I was. I will. And how much I weighed. Here, I'm sure it'll... Adjustment... Adjustment disorder with mixed disturbance of conduct. That still kills me. I'm trying to find these. I know you're like, why would you ever post this so publicly? 
I never really had that much of a problem talking about this. No one really dared ask. People in my family were like, oh, how are you? Yeah, we know all that stuff happened to you. Yeah. And my dad, yeah, I don't want to hear about it. Too bad. You told me about your Vietnam stuff. I did want to hear about that because I, I felt for you. I remember in Frazee when you were so hurt. It was a hard night talking to you. And I loved that, that night. So, again, they said that I was drinking. It's probably stole the beer, you know, and shared it between four kids in the back of the trailer. They called it horseplay again here. And Tom, I won't say your name. You were not very helpful. And here I'll rationalize their behavior. It's what they had to work with. That doesn't excuse them, the state of Minnesota, for special ordering a 12-year-old boy who'd been tortured to be stuck in a place that they knew was not appropriate for him. Everybody said that. Of course, they couldn't find any, you know, suitable home, and the one that they could find, they wouldn't let me go there. Mary, I love you. And Jim. Hmm. That got me upset. Uh... Yeah, again, just suitable foster placement. <laughs> I don't even want to say. I'm trying to get to the oh, this is so hard to read. Well, that's my MMPI code. I looked that up once. You know, it's some of it's a secret. I sent it out asking what it meant. And then here again, sexuality concerns. Yeah, my sexuality was I cared for people my whole life and it didn't matter if they were men or women. Because I saw inner beauty in them. 
I never judged anybody's sexuality. In fact, I didn't talk about my own with a lot of people because I thought it was no one's business. No one, you know, it's not very often that you walk up to somebody in the street and say, hey, how are you doing? By the way, are you sleeping with, you know, X, Y, Z and, you know? I mean, I don't know, maybe that is common practice. I'm pretty straightforward about, or forward about, you know, sexual things. I don't really, you know, of course I studied that, psychosexual disorders. I studied them myself with the DMS manual. Well, for one, to understand what had happened to me. And like I said, I was going to go to St. Peter, St. Peter's and work. Well, I wanted to do that. I wanted it at one time to be a, a psychologist for psychosexual disorders. Because <clears throat> I thought it would... I don't know. Isn't that weird? Being sexually abused and then wanted to work with. I couldn't... At that time, I was like, I, I made a decision I couldn't go work in St. Peter. <clears throat> but with little kids, I could have... I couldn't... Well, I should take that back. I couldn't have... Until probably a few years ago. I would have been too, still too emotionally angered by child abuse. <coughs> I told you that it took me a long time to realize that woman that I watched get arrested for abusing her kid. I was dealing with my own stuff at that time. And I was mad at her for doing it. I didn't know why she, I, well, there was no reason. I mean, it didn't matter. And like I said, everybody at work at North knew I was mad that night. In fact, that caused a lot of problems. I used to get in trouble at North for the police would, like, were violent with some of our psych patients. You know. And one time I had the, I told the police to arrest this man that wasn't a psych patient. And they said, we're not going to. And I'm like, at that time you were, you know, you're supposed to stand up for your rights and nurses were not supposed to be abused or threatened or pushed and um, I got in trouble with the hospital for standing up for nurses again like why would you bother right now of course I still would you know more psychological assessments <coughs> oh just drink some more water. I know, and some of the swear words, just ignore some of those. It's, I feel the label off this one. But it's still Gatorade. It's got the... Or I shouldn't... It's not like I'm doing product endorsements. I'm not. I'm just saying. I usually get them because, you know, you buy one, get one free usually. And so. Oh, there's another code. DPW104578. I don't know what that means.
I wasn't suffering from any learning disability. So it wasn't that I wasn't smart enough to learn in school. So Steve is a rather small boy. 4'11". Presented himself in a likable manner. I'm trying to find out how much it weighed. I was little. I like I said, I didn't start growing until I was I mean I had like a big growth spurt when I was 16, 17. I know. I'm trying to some of this stuff. Well, I think it's, I've got a lot of it in the written, or I printed out all of this stuff. Like I said, I had multiple copies of it. Oh. I loved her. She was a good teacher. Again, I just could read this suitable foster placement. Bar none actually said something like, sending him back to his mother is a mistake. <laughs> he should not go back there. I don't know how I got, said that I had a problem when I brought Dilantin onto the unit from school. Who knows? More horseplay. Said that I was I was readily accepted by my peers, and quick to establish friendliness with the staff and enjoy talking and interacting with them. <coughs> there were concerns about whether or not I was able to internalize, you know, some of my problem behaviors. So, this is what he said. Initially during placement, Steve portrayed himself as an, as an impulsive youth, running away and engaging in other types of negative behavior without thought of the consequences. Again, I just say, I was sexually abused there and tortured and abandoned. What, are the, what other consequences are there? I was locked in an adult institution, basically, with scary tunnels that we had to walk through. <coughs> and the other units weren't all locked. So other people, adults, were walking down there. And I don't have to tell you what they were doing down there. You can almost imagine. I must have been in around 90 pounds at that time. This is so comforting. And I'm more rationalizing, so I don't, I'm not going to do it. And here's my friends. They said that I described them as this. Mostly a bunch of druggies.
you know what they call druggies were those a lot of times they call druggies were those outcasts <laughs> no. you know are the people who smoked or they didn't really smoke you know you sold a cigarette from your parents every once in a while just to try it of course they you know He's described as a loner. Little activity in sports or other activities. That's not true. I mean, you didn't have a choice at that time. And, um... But you had Jim and Fayed, and I was in swimming and diving and track. And Grandma had us in gymnastics every summer. And the one time I did get into a fight, like a real, not a real fight, but it was in junior high. It wasn't really a fight, it was just a pushing match because I didn't like fighting. It was out in front of the junior high at the bus stop. I don't know what happened that started it, but it was one. I think they were making fun of me, probably. I think Margie came in like. I don't know. Sometimes I'm like, why am I doing this? It's not going to go anywhere. I mean, it doesn't seem like a... I think, I'm, well, I know why I'm doing it. I'm doing it for me. You know? Self-control. I had restrictions on family visits where they could only be monitored by the staff. And then again, I was at Mary's house several times. And of course, I said that I opposed it. What kid wouldn't want to still live with their mom? No one's going to take Savannah and Mia away from Stephen. Or... I know. No one. And, you know, they're in my heart so much that... In here it said that I was terrified of the older boys. And there were incidents where it was like, told the staff that he was scared when well, then something happened that I, I got abused that night. And then I ran away with some other kids that were getting abused too. Everybody kept saying, foster care. <laughs> I know. It said that I was really dependent on my mom, but she wasn't able to be there because of her own problems in her life. Part of that is how I rationalized it. I used to tell that to Marjorie and Chrissy and Rick. I'd be like, 
she did the best with what she had and she didn't have much. I mean, in many ways, her mom was just like her. You know, except, except for my grandma, Frances, loved me so much. I don't know why she picked me. I mean, I can see her too in that kitchen. It had a window right in front of it. Some of it, I mean, I should just make a movie and take the words out of it and then just stream it on. That would be too pain. No, I don't want to do that. Besides, I like talking like this because Sabea and me, if you ever grow up and wonder, well, you're going to grow up. But maybe if you don't know the truth, then one day you will. Like I said, ignore the swear words, because, well, don't ignore them. They, You know what? Parents swear sometimes. You know why? Because they're mad. <laughs> or because the words get a point across. You know? I do know some people who don't swear. It's... They do other things. I don't think Grandma swore very much, but she pounded on the floor and in her legs and on the table. I hated that when she did it, but I watched her. I didn't, wasn't gonna dare stop her. I mean. It said here that areas that I needed to work on in, in 1985, channel, channeling his energies more constructively. And impulsivity. And only minor squabbles with peers. More horseplay. Pestering staff probably for attention they said that in there can be clingy with staff yeah especially around bedtime i was always like hey what is of course you know no one calls it torture in the United States when children are brutalized and sexually abused and cut and strangled. And I'm not discounting torture in other countries at all. But be honest, there are tortured kids in the United States here in Minnesota. We all know it. And they call it child abuse. And then they abuse them again by sticking them in institutions with 40 kids, 50 kids, and think that that somehow is going to help them. You know what they become? A number. And you know what they do? Well, they form cohesive bonds within those organizations. Or it is an organization. Those kids form one. It's called, I'm going to survive this. And so, it doesn't help. It makes the situation worse. You know. And kids know how to survive. 
and sometimes they make sometimes it makes them better criminals just like jail you know sometimes it makes them shut down and hide and only say what they can get away with saying and then they stop all those feelings their li their life during their life and a lot of them turn to drugs and alcohol. I did. And those feelings of inadequacy from being abused and are sexually abused or physically abused spill over. A lot of those people are turn to like caring professions so they can somehow try to a lot. I'm not saying that I did this, but I could see where I was probably trying to, it was easier for me to help others than it was for me to help myself at some times. And that's true. And that's probably why I got so defensive about some, well, a lot of cases, and I stood up for patients so much, was because I knew what it was like to be voiceless and to not have a voice and that you know and you know what people may say well you never really cried that much about it and I was I would say this when I was little I cried every fucking night you know every night for almost 16 years and so yeah you do get to like shut down those feelings. They taught me to do that. And then nursing taught me to be, you know, like I said, I watched babies die and parents and brothers and sisters and grandmas, animals. I mean, yeah. And I'm not saying I loved being a nurse. You know, I did. It was hard because nurses didn't really care for each other there. You know. There was a few nurses that did. Judy, if you're listening, thank you. I know you believed in me. Tanya, we might not have agreed on everything, but thank you. And Michael, thanks for reaching out to me and I hope I helped you. I know you were going through some hard times yourself. And Riley, thank you for writing that nice letter. You know. And I hid all that stuff from people at work. People used to think that I was better than them. It's because I went to school with all that over my head that I was going to be a failure, that I wasn't going to amount to anything. And I took class after class after class after class. You know? And so I never told them. Maybe I told a few. Not really. I think I told Jean. And it's not something that men talk about very much. Not at work. I told you that day, well, one day I went, I wasn't having a good day. And I think it was Christmas Eve, or it was the holidays, and I went to the ICU. And this little baby, must have been like a month old, was intubated, and their parents weren't there. And the nurse wanted to give me a report, and I picked up the baby. It's 
not easy. You nurses know if an intubated baby, it's not easy to always, with lines and everything, to pick them up. And I just picked him up and sat in the rocking chair. And she was like, are you going to get report? And I said, what? Yeah. And she goes, do you want to write anything down? And I was like, it's in the computer. And I thought that, I walked in the room and I thought that baby needed to be held right away. I needed to be held. You know. Same with that rape victim on Easter. That I was good speak too. So, and you know, maybe I did a lot of those things for myself too. But I was going to be there for him. I knew enough Spanish to know what she was saying, but I was so afraid to speak it. I did my best. And I know I just, I held her hand and I, I tried to touch her hair, but I felt, I felt just standing there with her. She kept looking at me. Anyways. Yeah, that was hard. All right, well. Danger, danger. This call is from your phone. I better go. I'll talk to you later.